That's ominous. <laughs> Guilt, accusation, and you. <laughs> Me? Yeah, you. This morning was filled with a lot of distractions for me. I couldn't get my hair right, first of all. Oh, no. That's, that's terrible. And then the Mariners, they're down 5-0 to zero when, I, no. when I walked in here. Great. That's not good. Football, I couldn't get my mind off football. Normally I can do okay. But no, there's, there's church and then football. Like I'm able to distinguish the two. But today it was all muddled, all of it together. And I was like, oh, maybe the enemy doesn't want it. To have a discussion about guilt, accusations, and you then. Maybe this is going to, maybe, maybe it's not so ominous after all. What's ominous is ignoring it. What's ominous and scary is ignoring the idea of guilt and accusations. But uh, can, I, can I share with you my greatest recent guilt? No, no. Everyone's like, no, no, no. no. <laughs> please don't, please don't. So, it's something that's haunted me for a couple years now. Okay? I went to Dick's Sporting Goods. And I, I went to go buy a, a pair of baseball pants and some fishing tackle. Like every good college athlete does. It's like, I gotta go buy some clothes, and then I gotta go make sure I have my tackle box secured for, you know, this weekend. And uh, my total came out to like $22.98. And I walk up to the front register, and there's a girl I know. And she's, she's working there, so I'm like, hey, how's it going? She's like, hey, Brody, would you like to round up your total for charity? And without even thinking about it, I said, no. And she goes, I'm going to give you another chance to answer that. It's $22.98. Would you like to round up for charity? Then all of a sudden I was like, who are you to give me another chance? I'm going to put my foot down. And I looked her dead in the eye and I said, not today. Grabbed my stuff and walked out. And I was like, gosh, the nerve of that lady, right? <laughs> Giving me another chance to donate to charity. And then I realized, <laughs> it's two cents. And I said no twice. That's one cent each. <laughs> and that haunted me. Oh man, I'm a terrible person. Yeah. yeah. It's okay, next time my total was like, you know, there was like 70 cents left over, I was like, yeah, I'll pay it for you. <laughs> <laughs> guilt, accusations, and you. Are we supposed to feel guilty? Yeah. Yeah? When, when I say no to two cents? <laughs> Probably. But what is guilt and what is conviction? Because they're parallels. And you may be like, what? Parallels? Guilt and conviction? Parallels? And, and here's why. They're both tools. Okay? But before we get into tools and before we get into all this goodness, let's pray. Amen? God, thank you for today and this time to gather in your word. And Lord, I pray that you will help use what was taught to me to teach others and, and equip us to be able to handle living this earth with, with an enemy, God. And I pray that you will bless this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. So, conviction is a tool used by the Holy Spirit. Okay? It's a tool used by the Holy Spirit to say, hey, there's a specific thing you've done or that you are doing that is interrupting your relationship with God and it's causing you to fail putting the world back together. God wants to put the world back together, bring His goodness on earth, and there's something you're doing preventing Him from doing it. That needs to change. And there's always this, this, this yearn and desire to change when conviction is brought. When the Holy Spirit brings conviction, the purpose is for there to be change. Guilt is a tool used by the enemy to remind you of already confessed sins Right? Something you've already claimed that is wrong. Jesus, I need you to take that from me. It's something that's already happened, already confessed, but it comes back and it, and it frustrates you. And it stifles you from being passionate about God because you're like, oh, I'm not worth it. Oh, I can't believe I did that. And there's a passage in Psalms I want to dive into. And, and Greg did a great job leading into this. I think this is just an extension of what the communion, communion meditation was. But David in Psalm 32. I'm going to find out where I want to start. I think I want to start from the start. That's a good start. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, my God. Good start. Sorry. Chapter 32, verse 1. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and whose, and whose spirit there is no deceit. 
When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away. Through my groaning all day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me, conviction. My vitality was drained away as with the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you. Okay, that conviction. All of a sudden the recognition of sin and there's some change of heart. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. I don't know what your translation says, but mine says the guilt of your sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. What delivers you? Does guilt deliver you? No. Guilt leaves you trapped and enslaved and in bondage to the things you've already confessed and Jesus already died for. So when we're presented with guilt, we got to ask ourselves, where is it coming from? Is it coming from the Holy Spirit? Or is it coming from the world, the flesh, or the devil? What are we up against? Have you felt guilty before? Have, have there been things that you've done in the past that you've forgiven that come back and just nag at the back of your brain? Then you are part of a battlefield that is of supernatural proportions. That's not intimidating. It shouldn't be. Because I've read the back of the book and I know who wins that battle. So let's make sure we're able to be equipped and know, hey, hold on, hold on. This isn't from God. This is not from God. How are we supposed to take care of guilt? You know when you run into something that's said, and you're like, oh, I can't say it any better. <laughs> My English teacher always told me, if you run into something that is said better than you ever could, use a quote. Don't try and summarize. Don't try and change it. Just use a quote. All right. It starts with Scripture. Philippians 3, 13-14. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. That is perfection. Paul has not laid hold of perfection. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal of the prize of the, uphill, of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's Philippians 3, 13 through 14. And this was a little pamphlet, voice crack. This is a little pamphlet written by mentor, teacher, discipler, and, and he says, um, his name's Carl Payne, if you want to look him up. What did Paul have to forget? Plenty, right? Paul, I mean, what did he describe himself as? Chief of sinners. The chief of sinners, right? He's like, if anybody has, that's me. He was the religious zealot who had taken it upon himself to imprison or destroy every Christian and Christian church with whom he came in contact. After scattering the Christians in Jerusalem, he had even been given permission to hunt them down in other cities. After becoming a Christian, how do you think he felt about his past actions? Did the enemy use his past actions to make him feel guilty? Because if, if, if conviction liberates, and conviction causes change and reunion with God, all guilt does is remind you that you aren't good enough. You don't deserve it. You're guilty. But Paul realized that his past was just that, the past. No matter how often he may have wished it was not true. See, if you cannot undo, redo, or change the past, even if you wish you could, then why allow something you cannot change control the present and future? Common sense says let it go. Don't let your past... Limit your ability to serve God in your present or your future. It's something that we need to be able to look at and evaluate. Is this something I should feel guilty for or convicted over? If you've already confessed your sins and been right with God, you're seen blameless. There is no guilt to be had. <clears throat> Jesus Christ died on that cross for you so that God can see you perfect, just like his son. That's the power of the blood of Christ. 
And there are powers that don't like that power. You might wake up in the middle of the night from a dream about something you did in the past and you need to let that go. Because that guilt does not belong to be there. It's hard, right? It's hard to be able to evaluate something, especially when we feel something so strongly. If you can just feel it in your bones and you feel guilty and it's just, it nags. That's a freedom that can only come from God. Sometimes we aren't strong enough to look ourselves in the mirror and say, God has forgiven you. Because sometimes it's hard to believe, even ourselves. It's a lot easier to believe when someone comes alongside you and says, Hey, I've read that same scripture too. God has forgiven you. What kind of role do you have to help a brother or a sister handle guilt? I wasn't planning on coming across that question, but it came to mind. What kind of role do you have when it comes to helping a brother or sister through guilt? Because if someone can look in the mirror and struggle to believe the goodness of Christ because of their actions, maybe they need you to say, hey, I've read the book. You are crazy thinking that you aren't good enough. That's a real feeling the enemy wants you to feel. They want that division from you and God. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus loves you and your sin has been forgiven and it's time to move on. What's next? Okay? What about accusations? I experienced some accusations last night. I did. I was fishing. My happy place. I had my cousin, my brother, my uncle, and my dad on a boat next to Maddie and I on a kayak. Kayak fishing is difficult, especially when you got someone else in there, too. I mean, she had a hook in her hair, I lost a fish. Hopefully not at the same time. Not at the same time, no, no. She was the fish I lost. I was like, oh, okay. I had some accusations, because I had to row out there, right? That was a long row back after I lost a big fish. And I'm sitting there saying, oh my gosh, what? I'll be out here tomorrow. How can I do this differently? Like, how can I, how can I trust myself to fight a fish on a kayak? And all of a sudden, I'm sitting there, and, and a little voice in my head's like, yeah, you'll never do it. I'm like, Maddie, shut up. No, it's, <laughs> no, it's, it's like, no, you aren't good enough to catch fish. It's like, that doesn't sound like my own voice. I'm in the mode of how can I do better? Not, I'm never going to be able to do it. Oh, woe is me. I'm trying to figure out how to do it. And there's a voice that's like, no, you, no you, you suck at fishing, just like you suck at being a boyfriend, because a good boyfriend would catch a fish for, her girl, for his girlfriend, <laughs> and you're a bad brother because your brother didn't catch a fish because you were casting over his line. And all of a sudden, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> These are some accusations. Okay. This ain't just me, and it's not Maddie. This, something's, something's trying to start a fight. I'm being accused of being a bad fisherman. I already know that. But I'm being accused of all these things and I'm starting to kind of buy into it. Starting to believe. What does Ephesians 6, 16 say about accusations? Let's see, Galatians, Ephesians. This is the end of the armor of God. It says, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. I like the example of arrows, right? Because the, the, same, the same mentor and teacher and discipler that wrote that book that I was reading from, he told me, he said, I have done a successful job in discipling you. If you run into a situation and you have an arrow in your quiver, take care. Oh, I feel guilty. Wait a minute. I know some scripture for that. I've been forgiven. Oh, accusations. Hold on. I got the arrow of God. I know I can do that. Oh, someone, someone, someone's trying to tell me that, that my God's not real. 
I know some scripture for that one too. Bang. In the same way we need to be prepared with a quiver full of arrows, we have an enemy that has some of their own that's like, oh, I know what bothers him. Let's see if we can get it. Oh, there's a chink in the armor. Oh, there's a little bit of, a little bit of insecurity. Bang. Oh, they have a difficult relationship with like their, their kid or their parents. Okay, we can use that. Accusations and flaming arrows that we read of in Ephesians chapter 6, they're the same thing. If you are walking with Jesus, if you represent Christ, the enemy that hates Christ. It's a strong word. Hate's not a very common word used in the church. But for the enemy that hates Christ, wouldn't it make sense for them to try and mess with you a little bit? Accuse you? I think i got to back to this book because there's one more, one more section that I can't do any better on. I'm not very uh, theatrical. That was. That was, that was the end. <laughs> so I couldn't have done this myself, but this is called uh, Accusations, Act 1, Scene 1. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you want to come do it? <laughs> no. <laughs> you must have sinned today. You're feeling so bad. Why are you, why are you sad? You must have done something wrong. Something you've done. Can't believe you do such a thing. You're right. God, forgive me. I'm so sorry. I don't know what I did. I don't know when I did it, but if I'm feeling this much conviction, I must have done something bad. You really think God would hear an insincere prayer like that? That prayer is just bouncing off the ceiling. Confess your sin and pray again. And also, you forgot to begin with our Father. <laughs> God, please forgive me. I, I really, I, I'm, I'm really sorry. <clears throat> and I'm praying sincerely now about my insincere prayer. Didn't God hear you the first time? Confess your unbelief as sin. Father, forgive me for my unbelief. I'm so sorry, I doubted your promises. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Look at all this time you've just wasted. Are people going to hell while you're sitting here wasting time trying to figure out how you talk with your God? God, forgive me for wasting time and sending people to hell. You're a loser and a terrible Christian. Do you and God a favor and knock it off. This wasn't cut out for you, and you're a miserable example. You should give up. God, if you are all powerful, why don't you stop this? Why is this? Why is this here? Don't you love me? This isn't fair. Do you think a true Christian would attack the only one who loved them enough to die for them? You are not a Christian. Those, that's a pretty extreme and escalated conversation. But there, there is power among there is power about a believed accusation. The words themselves, oh you're not a good Christian, that means nothing until you believe. The enemy wants to make you as ineffective and as stagnant and petrified as they can. Whether it's guilt or accusations, they want you away from God. There are flaming arrows. There are accusations. That's a reality of the world we live in. But we have something so much power, so much greater, with so much more power than some accusations. The blood of Christ can quench any flaming air. Let's read the rest of Ephesians chapter 6. I feel like we just need to cover the whole body armor here. 
uh, starts in verse 13 of Ephesians chapter 6. Therefore, take up the full armor of God. What's the therefore, therefore, right? Why are we saying therefore? Well, we were just talking about uh, heavenly places and wickedness, the spiritual world in verse 12. So because of the spiritual world, because of the wickedness in the heavenly places, we should take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your hold on pages, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this view. Be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may not may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. We should not allow the presence of a battlefield to keep us from fighting. Paul says, hey, I want you to be praying for me too because just like you're experiencing this battle, I'm experiencing it experiencing this battle. And I want to keep my mouth open for Christ. So pray for me too. Pray for yourselves. Make sure you're keeping your mouth open. But don't forget the brothers and sisters. Don't forget the rest of us. A divided army is easily defeated. Pray for each other. Equip each other with the armor of God. Equip yourself. And you put on the armor of God just like you do your clothes, one leg at a time. But okay, God, I woke up this morning. I need to be prepared. It's going to start with you, okay? All right, God, I need your help. Can't do it on my own. That's a great start. That's a great place to be. I need your help. I can't do it on my own. So let's say I quit here. Stop talking, closed up my Bible, prayed it out. You might be wondering, well, hold on, hold on. How am I supposed to deal with guilt and accusation? What am I supposed to stand on with Scripture that says this is how I fix the problem? I recognize there's a problem. I can see it in my own life. Now, James 4, verse 7. Did any of you learn the Bible song? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, uh, I can't go through trying to find a book of the Bible now without singing it. And I'm not sure if I'm crazy or if it was just a really good learning tool. I'm not sure. Okay. Here's the cure. James 4, verse 7. Submit therefore to God. I like that. That's pretty easy. Okay. Submit therefore to God. Period. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. The tone starts to change. I think I've spoken on this one before. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning, and let your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Submit, therefore, to God. Step one. If you're in a situation where God's not number one, that's step number one. Make God number one. Step two, resist the devil. Say, hold on, no, no, no. I know scripture. I know what Psalm said. I know what Paul said. I do not need to feel guilty because my Savior died on the cross. <laughs> Praise God. Oh, hold on, hold on. No, wait, 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 wait. I don't need to listen to that accusation because that accusation is not from the Holy Spirit. The purpose of that accusation is to draw me away from God. I don't need to listen to it. That's what Ephesians tells me. And all of a sudden now, I'm like, wait a minute. I'm living out James chapter 4. I'm recognizing what's going on in my own head. There's some of that in 1 Corinthians too. Oh, we have to go on time. I'm recognizing what's going on in my own head. I'm evaluating the thoughts. And I'm realizing that these thoughts aren't from God. I need to reject and, and, and what's the, the scripture? 
The remix. <laughs> it's like a disc kind of skips that. <laughs> Submit therefore to God. Resist the devil. You start resisting once you start evaluating. Once you start listening with a critical ear of what's in your brain, my brain's a scary place. Your brain's a scary place. We don't know the brain. The brain is wild. But once you start evaluating, hey, why am I thinking this? Where is this coming from? We can, we can sort it out. This is good. Come on, hold on to this. You're loved. You're a child of God. You're forgiven. I'm going to hold on to that. I'm going to plant my flag on that. Then there's, how dare you? Who do you think you are? You're such a terrible person. How can God forgive you? How can God love you? Nope. That is not for my Savior. That is not for my God. Guilt, accusations, and you. You belong in the presence of your Father. Guilt and accusations, they deserve to be ignored and unheard. I don't know what you've done. And I don't care what you've done, because if you're forgiven, you're forgiven. And who am I to tell Jesus that his forgiveness shouldn't cover you? So guilt and accusations have no place in your life. Because Jesus, he owns your heart. God, thank you for thank you for today and, and thank you for your scripture. Lord, it's times like this where it feels good to be in your presence and it feels good to be in your word because man, life gets tricky when we're not. And God, I pray that as we go out in our in our weeks that you'll help us to remember to divide what's good and what's bad with what's being told to us. I pray that your goodness and your forgiveness is what is what lives in our hearts. And I pray that you help us to resist the enemy and resist the idea of, of guilt or, or accusations, Lord. All you accuse us of being is made in your image and redeemed by the blood of Christ. And I pray that we focus on that. In Jesus' name.